Hi, Greg Dell with Attorneys Dell and Schaefer, and I'm here with Attorneys Rachel Alters and Alex Palomara. And we're going to talk about long-term disability claims for financial advisors. And we've helped hundreds of financial advisors around the country at some of the world's largest um, financial advising companies, as well as private financial advisors. And there's all kinds of disability policies for financial advisors, ranging from their employer-provided policies to the private individual policies. And what's interesting about representing financial advisors is that they're in that your money, your life category. In the same way that financial advisors sometimes sell disability policies as well. Um, but there's also the financial advisors we represent a lot that manage money for people and assets and provide advising on retirement and life insurance and all of those other things. So but when it comes time to file a claim, they still have the same problems that their own clients do and everybody else. So hence, I guess they know to reach out to a lawyer to help them. But Alex, let's go right away into what are the common definitions of disability that you see for financial advisors that you've represented? Well, under the group policies, like you said, there's a difference between a group policy and individual policy. The group policy is going to be governed by the ERISA laws, most likely. Um, and the group policy is going to have kind of a run-of-the-mill uh, standard definition of disability that for the first two years you have, you have to be unable to perform the duties of your own occupation and after two years it's any occupation. For the own occupation standard it's kind of a, a very generic standard. It's not how you actually do your job at, at your specific employer. It's going to be how it's done in the national economy um, and that gives the opportunity for the insurance company to, to deny a lot of cases because they kind of dumb down the definition of disability or what your occupation is and they overlook certain aspects of your job that, you, that you're required to do on a daily basis. And um, it's kind of, uh, you know, that's why the individual policy is actually better because they're specific to your actual job. But a lot of people don't have individual disability insurance policies because they can be very expensive and whatnot or they don't know to buy them. But the definition of disability for the, under the ERISA group policies is, is not the, the best definition of disability. And then, Rachel, when dealing with your typical definition of disability for a financial advisor, how do you usually see that the disability carriers look at how the job's performed by a financial advisor? Well, you know, they'll look at the job, how it's performed in the national economy, and they'll say, you know, they're required. Basically, it's a sedentary job. So you're, if you're a financial advisor, you're sitting at a desk all day. You're not really required to lift much. You're not required to, you know, do a lot of physical activity. It's mainly you're using your brain and you're sitting at a desk and maybe you're on the phone and you're on a computer all day. So they're looking at it as, um, you know, a sedentary job from the beginning. So they're, you know, if you, if they, think that, okay, whatever issue you have, I have a lot of clients who have MS, for example, um, and they're financial advisors. And some people who are just diagnosed with MS are, you know, okay, but as years progress, a lot of times it becomes cognitively difficult for them to focus on, on what they need to focus on to manage portfolios for their clients. So um, a lot of times the, the carriers will deny the claim and say, well, yeah, we do agree that the diagnosis of MS was made, but we still think that they can do their job because it's sedentary, they're sitting at a desk, they can still use their computer, they don't have that much loss of function in their hands at this, at this point. So they look at the definition of disability in the national economy, I mean the definition of the work um, job description in the national economy and will say, yeah, we think that they're fine to perform this and, and oftentimes that's not the case. Yeah, but they, they, when they talk about this national economy, which is mostly in the group provided policies, right. which would be like, the people working at Citibank, at Wells Fargo, um, you know, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, these bigger companies that may provide this national economy, and, and then the disability carrier dumbs it down, like Alex said, and they say it's a sedentary job. So right. they take out the fact that you likely have a college degree, mm -hmm. you may even have a master's or a doctorate in finance or whatever it may be, and they basically say, that doesn't really matter. Can you sit in your chair for at least four to six hours a day sit there. Right. There's no cognitive impact. It doesn't matter that you have to do things for your client, that you have to be dialed in all day to what the stock market and the bond market and the treasuries and everything else is doing, that you have to be available for your 50 to 500 plus clients that you have and know their portfolios in and out. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but if you can sit in your chair, we think you can do your job. And Alex, what's wrong with that? And how do you get around that to win your claims for your clients? I mean, it's almost offensive when I see a denial letter where they're deny, denying a, a financial advisor's claim for that reason, you know, <clears throat> saying you can do a sedentary job. It's, you know, it's offensive and comical at the same time. Um, to get around that, you obviously have to prove to the insurance company what it means to be a financial advisor, what your specific job duties are, what you're doing on a daily basis, you know, what your training, education, and experience is. Um, and you have to prove to them that you know, it's not just sitting there all day. It's, it's a very cognitive job. You have to be on point all day, every day, because it's not only your income that's coming in to be able to, to do your job. But oftentimes, you have other people's income, you know, other, their, their money is right. your responsibility. It's a very, be a very high stress job, and, and you have to be on point all day, every day. So this, for an insurance company to say, this person, their back issues not that severe, they can sit there all day, or they're, you know, whatever issue they're dealing with, they can still sit there and, and perform this job, it's, it's comical. It's, it's, I always get offended whenever I see those denials. Rachel, you often see, especially with the financial advisors, and most of the disability claims are chronic conditions. Right. Whether it's MS, whether it's a back condition, neck condition that they've had for a while, um, so many different, you know, all the gamut of medical conditions that we've seen. And often with the financial advisors, they don't want to file disability. It's not like they're making more on disability and they're like, oh, no. great, let me file disability because I was making 300000 a year and I'm going to continue to get 25000 a month on disability and it's tax free. It doesn't work like that. It's usually 60%. So there's no reason for them to go on disability. But they've been working with the issue for sometimes months to years. Right. And they've been doing the job and their income stayed the same and now they want to file or they did file and they got denied and the disability carrier says, yeah, we get it. You have all of these conditions, but what changed? How do you win that claim? Well, oftentimes when they, you know, hopefully they're calling me before they file the claim because if you've, they've already filed the claim and they have this history of working for the past 10 years with this condition and the, you know, it's not necessarily that the condition hasn't progressed, but sometimes the doctors aren't that good at documenting the progression of the symptoms or the progression of the disease. So oftentimes when they call me, they say, you know, I'm thinking I, I, wanna, I wanna stop working. I really can't do this anymore. I can't focus. I'm in a lot of pain. Um, I have, you know, millions and millions, hundreds of millions sometimes of dollars that I'm responsible for. And I don't feel like I'm at the top of my game right now due to my condition. And my doctor is suggesting that I stop working. And I said, well, hold on, don't do anything yet. Let me look at your medical records right. to see how the doctors are documenting because like you said, if the, they've been doing this and they've had this condition for 10 years, five years, three years, however long, what the insurance carriers tend to do is say, well, you've been working with this condition all along, you've been doing fine, you haven't missed a beat. So why is it different now? So what I do is I, tend to, I tell them to go in to see their doctor and maybe over the next couple months, few months, explain to them, because some people are also very afraid to tell their doctors everything that's wrong. So you gotta go in and be honest with the doctor and tell them I'm getting worse, this is what's going on and make sure that they're documenting it. Alex, Rachel talks about documenting it. What needs to be in the medical records and why is it so important? Well, I wanted to kind of expand on what Rachel was saying first is that, you know, I like to make the argument to the insurance company that just because someone was acting as a hero, you know what I mean, and going above and beyond, and they probably could have made the claim years earlier. You can't, it's, you can't really use that against them. I think it's offensive when they do. And in fact, if someone's been working through pain for six months, nine months, a year, a couple years, you know, it's a testament to their credibility. The, the fact that they, that they didn't make a, a claim prior saved the insurance company a lot of money, perhaps, you know, $25,000 a month for a couple of years. And the fact that they're trying to hold it against them, that they didn't make a claim prior, it, it, it always shocks me when the insurance company try, tries to utilize that argument. Right, but that's a regular, All probably one of the top five arguments is you've worked through it, you should be able to continue, try a new medicine, try a new brace, try a new procedure and you should be fine. Instead of denying the claim, they should actually send them a plaque and say, thank you for saving us, saving us money for the last three or four years, you know? But talk about that along the lines, going back to my question about why the documentation in the medical records is so important in order to get the claim won. So as a claimant, you know, it comes down to this. It's your duty to prove your claim. The insurance company is not gonna prove it to themselves that you're disabled. You know, you know, they might ask, say, sign this authorization, we'll get the medical records and we'll, we'll review the medical records and see if you're disabled or not. It's your duty to prove to the insurance company that definition of disability. And proof is in the form of medical documentation, which is your medical records, and support from your treating providers. So it's so important to talk to your doctors and make sure that your medical records are as strong as they possibly can with as much objective evidence or at least any evidence whatsoever in your file is in there. Everything has to be in your file. If it's not in your file, 
It's not going to be proved to the insurance company. If it's not proved to the insurance company, there's no way you're going to be considered disabled by them. And if it's not in your file, we have to file a lawsuit. There's no way we can win that lawsuit if the proof is not in there. The, the other thing about financial advisors is it's also, it's a big sales position. And, you know, a lot of the disability carriers have basically no understanding of that. You know, financial advisors need to get clients. They don't just all work for these big banks. And even when they do, they don't get spoon fed these clients, especially if you're a successful financial advisor. You've got to hustle. You got to be a people person. You got to build that relationship with clients. You got to do good at your job so that your clients recommend other clients. And if you're uncomfortable or you're suffering or you don't look physically well, people aren't going to have the confidence in you to continue to hire you. So while they think it's just sitting behind a desk, that's really not what the financial advisors do. They've got to have meetings. They've got to, you know, meet with their prospective customers. They've got to be available to attend um, earnings calls and, and company meetings. And then they have to do the training and they have to know everything that's going on. Because when I call my financial advisor, I want to ask them about any of the hundreds of publicly traded companies and I want them to be dialed in and know exactly what's going on because that's what he's hired for. I don't pay attention to what's going on every day, otherwise I wouldn't have a financial advisor. So how does a person do that when they're like, oh, I have to lay down for an hour or I'm taking my medication and I get foggy and if I don't take the meds, then I feel horrible. But when I do take the meds, I'm foggy. So, you know, I'm talking about all these issues because we've seen, you know, as I'm going, I'm thinking about this client and that client. It's like a ping pong in my mind about every different scenario we've seen and every denial we've seen to kind of make it like, for our potential clients and you know to understand that we understand all those issues the companies kind of know them but they don't care right and and that's the you know that's the biggest challenge when presenting these claims so what i recommend for the financial advisors is and, and also their clients because financial advisors have referred us tons of clients because they work with very high level professional successful people right. they may have even sold them the policies is that we will always provide an initial free consultation. And what that means is we'll either review the policy if you're considering filing. If you're in the claim process, we'll get involved right away and take a look at what's going on. If you're denied, we'll jump in, look at the denial letter, let you know what we think are your options. We do all of this complimentary in the beginning so that you know we determine whether or not we think we can help. And also to let you know what's at stake if we think we can get the benefits paid. Um, we have all kinds of videos we recommend that you watch regarding all the different disability companies, all different kinds of medical conditions that we discuss, and lots of tips that we think you'll find helpful at no matter what stage of the claim you're at. We always encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube videos so that you can see future videos that we put out that we think will be helpful for you. And we welcome the opportunity to speak with you should you need our help in the future.